It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Therod is here, and believe it or not, we are going to cover in just a few minutes the entire history of the Windows platform, plus updates on Duke Nukem Forever, Connect, and more. It's all ahead with Windows Weekly next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thurot, episode 213, recorded June 16th, 2011. He sounds taller on the radio. Windows Weekly is brought to you by GoToAssist Express. Doing tech support in person is expensive and time consuming. Save time and money and look like a hero to clients or colleagues with GoToAssist Express for a free 30-day trial. Visit gotoassist.com slash windows. And by audible.com. To download the free audiobook of your choice, go to audible.com slash windows. And by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, visit netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Windows Weekly with Mr. <laughs> That's not really going to catch on, is it, Paul? Mr. Paul Therat is here. Way over here. Yeah, way over where he's leaning. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you, you have, you're, you're, I move my camera. I don't know. The left-leaning Paul Therat is here. Actually, it's <laughs> yeah. left for him, right for us. Isn't that a metaphor? Wrong for, for everybody. <laughs> for American politics. He is the editor-in-chief of the Win Supersite, Supersite for Windows at winsupersite.com. He is the news editor for Windows IT Pro. He is the author of Windows Phone Secrets, brand new. He is uh, yeah, so many things to so many people. <laughs> <laughs> Soon to be the co-author of Windows 8 Secrets, sir. So you've committed, huh? I have. Congratulations. That's exciting. Okay. Does that involve so uh, the signing of a contract? You are going to say sodomy there for a second. Does that involve... Um, no, does we, it involve... <laughs> <laughs> that'll be later. Um, it does involve the signing of a contract, yes. So they, so they, do you have a signing ceremony, like, you know, when Hirohito handed over his sword, like that kind of thing <laughs> on the battlefield, battleship uh, um, deck, or... You know, that was only attempted once in my presence, and let's just say it didn't work out well, so we don't do that anymore. I give, it, I give you my sword, sir. So that's no, good. The stories, so, the stories I could tell. Do they take you to dinner? Do they do anything? <laughs> they don't do anything. Yeah, At this there, are, point, there are meals. You've written so many books. At this point, it's almost, a, I mean, even I, whom you begged in the, in the manner of Odysseus, who I begged know. his crew to tie him to the mast so that he would not be seduced it's like by the, the It's like the song. man code, Leo. You know, you are bound you can't to prevent me. me from doing this. And it didn't, I failed. You could do the Al Pacino. They keep pulling me in! <laughs> so do you, did you put up a fight at all? No. No, I didn't think no. you did. No, I'm a sap. I'm telling you, it's just like pregnancy. It's like This time's going to be different, Leo. Yeah, right. Yeah, I've heard that before. <laughs> This time it's good. What does your wife say? Does she 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 probably she probably thinks you make money on these? No, she knows. Um, Poor woman, she's completely. No, I think my, my the thing my wife's happy about this year is that this is the first summer in maybe three years where I didn't have a book. Yes. for the summer. That's nice. So the yeah, kids are so, home. You're camping. You're doing fun stuff. Going to the ballpark. Yeah, I can actually. You know, uh, my parents are in town. Uh, awesome. We're gonna go down and have dinner with them. Can you come? Yes. Oh, I can. that's nice. You know. I haven't yeah, had a weekend off since uh, 2004. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I mean, I work weekend. That's what the radio show does to you. And then uh, weekends and yeah. holidays. No, I mean, I work I mean, I mean, work seven days a week, really. But You I, do, don't you? you I, really can, do. I, space, I try to space it out. You know, yeah. the point being that if, uh, you know, it's the middle of the afternoon on a Wednesday and we're going to drive down an hour to wherever we go, uh, that should be okay because I'm going to be sitting here in front of my computer on Saturday and Sunday. And, you know, that's the way I do things, so... It's okay. Well, congratulations. I mean, I should have said this. Yeah, yeah congratulations. Congratulations. That's wonderful. It's exciting. Solidations are, are and, cons and, and as consolations and congratulations. But as a, as a reader, we're very pleased because those are, frankly, those are, those are the books that we get. I mean, I have Windows Vista Secrets, Windows 7 Secrets, Windows Phone Secrets. Those are the books. Those are the ones you want, kids. I agree with that statement. 
<laughs> now, I just uh, we have somebody watching for the first time. Yep. Uh, Wadey from the first K. From the UK. I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> from the UK. Not the first K. From yep. the UK. And the Wadey says, I've, I've listened for years, and this is the first time I've seen Leo, and he is not at all as I thought he would be. Yeah. You're like Jonathan Benjamin, you know, the guy that does the voice acting on uh, Bob's Burgers and right. Archer. I sound handsome, tall. Yeah. You dark. Know, dark, rich. Classic. You know who you do look like, though, is that Fred Dosecki's Flintstone. guy? Dose oh, do I? I'd like to look like him. Yeah, yeah that's not he? so bad. I am do you have a, like a cougar that runs around I your am, kitchen when I you're am, cooking? I am the beer man. So, Wadey, let me ask you this. Look at Paul. You've been listening to him, too. Does he look like what you thought? See, Paul look looks... I think Paul, I think Paul looks like what you think. <laughs> a schlub. No, 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 no. No, oh, you're sorry. quite, you're quite a, you're, well, I hesitate to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I, you know, you're handsome. You're a good looking fella. Yikes. Yeah. And uh, I am also physically attracted to you. Is that what we're looking <laughs> no, for? No, don't go there. <laughs> See, my <laughs> romance. Uh, I do look taller on the radio. It is true. <laughs> you sound taller, too. You, you look, and uh, just for those of you who, who have never seen Paul, who are listening at home, He's a he's a dead ringer for Brendan Fraser. <laughs> yeah, he does. Okay. You've gotten that before. You know who? I, well, okay. I don't know if I want to go into this conversation, but yeah, okay. That's good. Okay, let's move on. Yeah. Let's let's talk about Windows because that's really why we've gathered today. <laughs> it says is. And there is still much to say. Settle down into your chair, sir. Relax. Sit back. Let's let's <laughs> chat. I hate it. You know, it started with airline pilots. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. It started with airline pilots, but now freaking everybody says that. Every time, anywhere. It's like the ultimate cliche. And I'm so sick of it. I am never going to... Please, do not sit back. Whatever you do, do not relax, and you mm. will not enjoy this ride, folks. If I were to lean back right now, I'd probably throw my back out. So I'm gonna, just going to lean forward. That's okay. <laughs> okay, here's another, here's another guy. He says, you look like Mark Tejera of the New York Yankees. <laughs> oh, God. Tejera. Tejera. Uh, yeah. Uh, hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, just I'm just drawing a picture for those of you who sure. are listening only to audio. Can I draw a picture of what you look like for these people? <laughs> I know. I look like the guy on Magnum P.I., the sidekick. What's his name? No, 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 no. You know who you look like is, um, uh, I think it was the beginning of, I think. I'm, I'm Bear. Mix up these movies, but in the, I think in the beginning, I think it was the beginning of either Diamonds or Forever, or the, maybe it was the first Roger Moore movie, which may have been Live or Let Die. Mm -hmm. There's a scene in the beginning where he goes after the guy from Spectre, and he, he's in a wheelchair, and he throws him into a... I look like Ernst Stavro Blofeld. Yes, That's what that you're guy. saying. You do. <laughs> That's so obscure. It really doesn't help anybody. I would say more people know what I look like than that guy. That's actually probably they true. They probably should say, that guy looks like me. That would be a more useful comparison. <laughs> okay, but you know what I'm saying? Like the... I think he had a cigarette in one of those cigarette is he, holders. Is the, and, is the guy with a nude cat that he pets? I think so, in his yeah. Lap? He yeah. gets stumped in the mud by Sean yeah, Connery, Warfeld. I think. Yeah, or, Warfeld. I can't remember which one it yeah. was. I, Ernst Stav... How do I know his middle name? I don't know. Ernst Stavro Blofeld. And now, All right, you know, who, you know who else I look like? <laughs> okay, <laughs> one more, and then really, we've got to go. The guy who, I don't know his name, because he's kind of an obscure actor, but the guy who was in the movie The Losers? Oh, this guy. The main guy? Yeah, that's what I look like. <laughs> there you go. That, that guy. Sure. I look just no, like wait, wait, him. Hold on. Let me, let me, hold on one second. No, that is, that's not, is that Cannon, no, wait, was it Cannonball Run, or was it yeah, it looks actually, like, the, it looks could like, it have been the horrible third Smokey in the Bandit movie? It's, it's either a Smokey or a Cannonball, it is. But you know, know Burt Reynolds is there, is somewhere. Breaking yeah, but up. which one is it? I don't know. Chat room, gonna, who is it's gonna, that? It's going to bug me. Is that, uh, that's from Living Actually, Let no, he was in a James Bond movie. This guy? He, he was, in fact, a sheriff. Yes, he was a sheriff in a James Bond movie. The, um, the one with the, with the boat jump over the land and, yes. Is this he, from that Live, guy was in a James Bond this movie. This is from Live and Let Die? Wait a minute, I could try it with Google Image Search. Oh, he absolutely was. So that's him. That's what it was. Ernst Stavro Blofeld. I, I kind of always thought no, of him as a little more that's dapper. That's not Blofeld. That's just, he's like a southern <laughs> sheriff. But, yeah. but it was a James Bond movie. He's a smoky. Yeah. I mean, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is, you know, this is actually, uh, we, can, we can actually segue into tech news here with this. Eventually. Yeah. Google has an image search. <laughs> and I am apparently the only person in North America who has access to it. I don't know how that happened. They usually do not. Google image search. 
Yeah, I'm you know where you drag an image into the Google? You drag it into the Google? Yeah, watch. So here's really? the, here, I can do it. Here's the image. Search by image. And I drag it in here. Oh, actually, I have to go to images first. Images. I see. Okay. And then I drag it in, search by image. Let's see if it works. It, it's never worked for me yet. You know, I have oh, yeah. to turn off the experimental features I've found. This, so, this is so strange. Um, if you have experiment, oh, I can't forget it. I don't know how it works. I'm doing it here, but with a different picture. Just, oh, <sighs> I got that uh, snap screen. <laughs> for that's, that's Sheriff. Okay, I don't need Google. I've got the chat room. Okay. Sheriff J.W. Pepper. J.W. Pepper, does that ring a bell? I don't remember his name, but it's definitely from a James Bond. Yeah, movie. it's James from Live and Let Die. That's J Sheriff J.W. Pepper. And Liver Let Die was, in fact, the first Roger Morris. Uh, That's James right. That and, and I look just like him. <laughs> All right. Moving along. For some reason, I'm not sure, actually, one of the reasons I've been stalling. Yes, sir. Is I see, you know, maybe people don't know this. I should say this because people often blame me for the meandering nature of this show. Yikes. And actually, I'm just following your script. I'm just going to I'm just going to throw Paul under the bus because the first thing here says talk about James Bond movies and who Paul looks okay, like. Okay, I admit that was my fault. <laughs> I'll take I'll take okay. Jeez. <laughs> but now we segue in and this is the problem yes. is I have not yet I try to come up with a segue as you well know, a blend it, so this is the smooth Oh, no, no, you're good at it, but I'm curious what you're what why are you apologizing? You're going to segue into 1 2 3 4 Five straight Microsoft stories. No, and I'm not apologizing for that. I'm just trying to think. How do I how do I segue into item you one? Can't. This is a hole from which you cannot dig let, yourself. Let, <laughs> you know, speaking of live and let die, let's take a stroll through the history of Windows. Nice. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yes. why are we. Do is this because Windows 8 is coming and you want to kind of say how we got here? Yeah, I actually um, I wrote an article uh, that I don't want to reiterate here. I want to expand on it. In the the article was about the user experience in Windows, and it, it went back to Program Manager, which debuted in uh, essentially in Windows three. Um, obviously, there were early versions of what became Program Manager in Windows one and two, and the various you know the two eighty six, three eighty six versions that came before it. But I think we can all agree that Windows wasn't a big deal until Windows three. You know, it was fun because. Um uh, yesterday, when we interviewed the guy who uh, wrote BIOS for the original IBM PC, Tom brought, brought downstairs his PS2, yeah. and it booted up into a, a menu that, among other things, allowed him to launch Windows 2. Nice. Yeah. But Windows 1 and 2 really were just kind of almost like, you know, they Norton, were almost like Norton DOS Commander style were, yeah, shells, yeah, you know? That's exactly right. Yeah. It wasn't until 3... It wasn't until 3, I would say, and, you know, we could quibble about that, but I would say it, th 3 was a notable, I think, for a number of reasons. One, it was the first one that sold in any notable measure. And, and two, it was the first one where I think they had really, even though it was something that ran on top of DOS, they, they came up with something that was its own platform, its own environment, you know, that uh, it was a viable and somewhat mature environment for developers to target, you know. So, I, 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 as I wrote in this article, you know, I and we've probably discussed this a few times on the podcast. Um, I was a Commodore user as a kid and an Amiga user as an early adult. And, you know, I viewed the Microsoft stuff with some amount of scorn. Um, I, as a very early kid, my first experience with anything Microsoft was, in fact, basic on the Commodore 64. And it was my first experience of this is okay, but there is so much better out there. <laughs> you know, um, on the, on the, on the uh, Commodore side, you know, you had uh, what they had done at Microsoft for the basic. And, micro, you know, remember Microsoft in the early 1980s was all about getting basic on every single microcomputer ever made. That was their primary function. Um, we had uh, various add-on cartridges and also disks, of course, that would provide more capable languages, including better versions of basic, you know, for... for um, for the Commodore 64. And by the time the Amiga came around, you know, the version of the uh, Microsoft Basic that was on the Amiga was horrible. I mean, it was absolutely terrible. And uh, that was my, it was so bad that it was my first, it, it sort of jump started my first experience with true high level languages, you know, programming languages like uh, C or Pascal that were meaningfully sophisticated, you know, compared to the, uh, the stuff that was available at the time. So anyway, but by the time Windows 3 came out, you know, my wife had an IBM PS1, which, by the way, makes a PS2 look like a supercomputer. Um, 
and I asked a friend of mine to give me a copy of Windows 3 so I could run it on a computer just to see what it was like. And, and I think I described this on the podcast at least once before in the past, but it was so painfully slow that you could literally watch everything render in real time. You know, you would click on a menu and the menu would, the line would draw around the menu and then the lines would fill in and then each line of text would fill in. It was, it was like you had slowed it down as if you were watching a TV show and you put it in slow motion. It was absolutely horrible. And so, you know, to me at the, in the day, and this would have been 1990, roughly speaking, you know, as late as that, Microsoft to me was just a joke. <laughs> you know, I just didn't think they did anything good. I was really unimpressed with everything that Microsoft did. You so. were an Amiga guy. I think people don't, don't realize that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You are Mr. Amiga. So I remember, <laughs> yeah. you know, I remember vividly, Dvorak and I yep. were doing the, the radio show back then. Yep. What was this, you'd say, 1992? I think three? Uh, Windows 3 was 1990, I think. I want to and say the 3.1 was the one that really... Yeah, probably 3.1 was the just the explosive. It's funny because three, you know, 3.0 to 3.1 is not a huge jump. I think, and I'm doing no. this right off the top of my head, but it was like true type fonts and, you know, some other things. But it, it was really just a, a fit and finish kind of uh, a thing. Well, but that was enough for me. You know, me, I'm a, yeah. a you know, yeah. proto Mac user. enough for everybody, apparently. I mean, yeah. I... Yeah. Back then, remember, you know, there was still... You would still upgrade DOS too separately, right? So Microsoft right. came out with DOS right. five and right. six and six one and six two and six two two and you oh, know there were all DOS these different 5. versions. That was of DOS. the one. DOS five was the classic. Yeah. So there were there were all these optimizations you could make right. on either side of the system because the DOS part of it would control the boot up, and then there were Windows any files that would control you know the configuration of uh, of Windows. I'm sorry, but you were saying you were doing. Well, I just radio. remember uh, we, we were doing the radio show. We were talking a lot about Windows. I had already, you know, I bought a Mac in '84, so I've been using a Mac for eight years by this time. Yep, and loved it. But uh, but I looked at three one, and and I remember I was in the Xerox room at the radio station. This was a, what an epiphany this was. I and I played with three one. I said, "Wow," and you know, I said, "This is good." And you know, yeah. not with surprise so much as like, "Yeah, this is it." And then uh, here's the thing that kind of ties that in, in a loop is 10 years later, I remember talking with Steve Jobs. He was still at Next at the time. And he said, we had it in 84, we had a 10-year lead on Microsoft, uh, yeah. which we frittered, blew it. we frittered away. And he even said, by the time Windows 3.0 came out, we had lost that lead. Yeah. So even, even Jobs acknowledges that. That was the... That was the there, there's a, uh, a relatively unknown story that in the late 1980s, you know, Windows was doing terrible. Microsoft had partnered with IBM to do OS 2. And, and to the publicly facing world and to OS, and to, micro, and to IBM rather, uh, that was Microsoft's strategy. Um, th there was not, you know, the, the thing that made Windows go ahead was a Skunk Works project, literally two or three people um, that figured they could, you know, advance Windows enough that it would be viable as its own OS. And Microsoft had, in fact, given up on it. Microsoft had also gone, you know, Bill Gates had gone to John Scully, who was then the CEO of Apple, and offered to do the same thing with them and the Mac that they had done with DOS and PC makers, which was, you license the OS, we'll support it with our applications, and we'll, you'll become the, the new IBM. You know, you have to think, Microsoft, by the, you know, when they had partnered with IBM, it seemed like a good idea up front, but they, I don't think they understood what they were getting into in some ways. And I think IBM was, in many ways, an awful experience for them. And uh, one that I think that was uh, Bill, uh, Steve Ballmer, uh, hello. Yeah, Steve Ballmer had likened to, you know, riding the bear uh, because, you know, it was big and powerful, but it could also throw you and, and kill you. And, uh, I th you know, they offered this business to Apple. And, you know, for reasons that in retrospect were probably wrong, but I think at the time seemed, seemed to make sense. Apple wanted to control its own destiny. You know, they told Bill Gates to go shove it. And, uh, you know, they went down their own proprietary uh, path, you know. So it's, 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 it's amazing to me that this industry could have turned out so very differently, you know, if other things hadn't happened. You know, there were companies that were very big success stories in the early 80s, like Atari yeah. and a Commodore. People have forgotten had, them, practically. Completely forgotten now, but had a very um, advanced, in some ways, 16-bit computer systems that, you know, we just forget about now. When was OS 2? Uh, you know, the first couple of versions of OS 2 were very DOS-like, right? They were right. basically more advanced versions They were versions DOS, weren't DOS. they? Yeah, IBM yeah. made them, and it was DOS. And then, you know, they, they added a... I can forget the name of it. It was... Uh, the interface was something very similar to Program Manager. Uh, 
can't remember the name of it. P, I think it might have been called PM. I can't remember. But they came up with a graphical user interface, of course. It was a, a shared code thing. So they had IBM guys working on code and Microsoft guys working on code. And, of course, these two companies couldn't get along to save their lives. You know, IBM was all about check-ins and people checking the code right, and right, right. making sure everything was right, was right. And Microsoft was quick and dirty. Like, it was a let's bunch of hippies. Up. Yeah. I mean, Completely look at those different. first pictures of them in Albuquerque. Yeah. The yeah. scruffy-ass gang. And then the IBM's engineers with the skinny black ties yep. and the white well, shirts. They probably all wear ties where they were programming. Yeah. And, yeah. They hated each other. You know, they just didn't get along. It was a culture clash. It was, you know, it was just a culture yeah. clash. Yeah. Pretty amazing. I, I love yeah. that. So, okay, 3-1, then three one one Windows for Work Groups. Yeah, so there was a, you know, there was a Windows for Work Groups product that was basically just Windows 3 whatever with... Networking features, uh, right. what we think of as workgroup networking features, non-domain um, networking features. That was the first version of Windows that I thought had some merit, oddly enough. Um, I wasn't a big fan of the UI, and people forget this, but you know, we tend to think of Windows 95 as being the version that ushered in 32-bit whatever. But all that 32-bit stuff was actually in Windows for Workgroups 3.1.1. It was off by default. But you could go turn it on. It was it was like 32-bit memory access, 32-bit uh, file system, you know, disk access, and some other things. You would click a couple of switches, and what you had was a a pretty decent compromise between you know what Microsoft had elsewhere in NT, and then their mainstream OS. And, and it it you know again there were there were always weird compatibility issues, but it basically enabled you on that more compatible system to have a more capable system too that could address more RAM and bigger disks and all that kind of stuff. So. You know, they were always advancing it under the covers, but I always, you know, I, I just, as an Amiga guy and having, you know, drag and drop and all that stuff, just like you and the Mac, I mean, I looked at the Microsoft stuff, you know, the UI stuff, and I, I was always blown away in the wrong kind of way by just how horrible it was. And I never understood why this was so popular. Um, but then I got on... And then... Came 1995. <laughs> Pat Benatar was on the charts. <laughs> yes. Probably Kenny Loggins. But yes, Kenny it was Loggins. a... Prime Minister you know, <laughs> Pollock resigned from the Polish Parliament. Right. Deutsche Telekom no, I, I... launched Sri Lanka's first GSM <laughs> mobile phone network. And Windows 95 was born. Start you, me up. <laughs> right. Well, before that, though, um, you know, obviously that was in beta. And it was going to be Windows 4. That was how I know, knew it at the time. And there were various milestone builds, you know, as they always do now, we, M1, M2, and so forth. And I, I, I got into this beta program at some point uh, through a professor who was a co-author. We had written some books about Microsoft application software and Visual Basic. And all of a sudden, all this stuff started happening. You know, there was what became Windows 95. There was a new version of Office that was also 32-bit Office 95. There was the Plus stuff, which was new. Uh, for Microsoft, and they were doing MSN, right, the Microsoft Network, which, you know, again, it's, it's hard to even conceive of this at the time, but in the mid-1990s was originally designed to be a proprietary online service like, at the time, CompuServe or Genie or AOL or whatever those things were. You, they were going to provide dial-up access to the Internet, and they would have this walled garden. And it was really, it was neat because Microsoft had changed the the shell of Windows to have all these floating windows like you see on the Mac and, and ex what they call a, uh, an Explorer user interface. And the original MSN, you would navigate it just like you would navigate Explorer. They were basically, they were pretty, but they were basically implemented as folders in the shell. And you would navigate into the service just as you would navigate into your file system through this Explorer shell. You know, so even though they kind of missed the big picture, i.e. that the Internet was coming, they kind of got, they had this cool idea for the UI that really integrated into Windows 95 in a fantastic way. And, um, you know, we also kind of forget about this, but it was fear of MSN, which is hilarious in retrospect, that drove companies like AOL and CompuServe to, uh, if not threaten Microsoft with antitrust uh, complaints or actually go to the government and complain about them. And there were various deals where, remember, AOL had was pre-installed in Windows 95 or, you know, at least the icon was in there and, you know, the, these guys were scared to death of MSN, you know, because Microsoft was such an uncontrollable force of nature, it seemed. Yes, it was going to take over. We all know that. MSN was going to be the future. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Uh -huh. MSN, in many ways, you know, I mean, they've had some high-profile uh, blunders, you know, like Bob and MSN would, would have to fall into this category. Um, 
But it's funny because these things happen when Microsoft, it seemed like Microsoft could do no wrong, but of right. course Microsoft made all kinds Some people of people were People were afraid. It's hard to remember how dominant Microsoft was in that era and how afraid people were. Remember, there was yeah. a whole idea that if you showed Microsoft your product, they would basically do it and then, you know, yep. you would, you'd lose it. Now Apple does that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. If, if, yeah. Microsoft called it embrace and extend. We, we yeah, call yeah. it engulf and devour or whatever, sure, sure. whatever it Apple was. Apple doesn't actually call it anything. It just does it. It, just, and it, 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 it pretends it has no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah this is like iOS 5. We, we, we did, did reject it. your Wi-Fi sync app. <laughs> oh, that was terrible. Oh, you my don't mind God. if we steal the icon and the idea. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, after it's, 95, NT really did change things. Microsoft had basically two tracks. They had a consumer track and a business track. Another they had, thing we also forget about. I, I would, you know, it's funny. I, I couldn't even describe NT as business back then because the, the problem with NT, NT, you know, I, I want to say the first version came out in 93. They, they called it NT 3.1 because that was the version of Windows at the time. That's they right. adopted they the same with shell. Three. That's right. First version was 3.1. Yeah. They adopted the Windows 3.1 shell, the program manager. You know, there's a file manager, a task manager, and a print manager, you know, all these different manager programs. Um, because, you know, they wanted a user interface consistency between the two, which made plenty of sense. In fact, they also did the APIs for developers to be the same so that there were 16-bit and 32-bit versions of APIs, and they would change the names a little bit for the 32-bit uh, the, the versions. Did I say 16 and 32? I did, I hope. I think so. Not 32 and 64. No, we didn't back get 64 then it, till... Back uh, then it was 16 and 32. Sorry yeah. if I screwed that it's up. Like, I think the first 64-bit um, uh, NT was right around the same time yeah. as SP, right? I always wanted to run NT. You know, I, I used to... Who didn't? Look at it. That's you why know? Windows 2000 was the best version of Windows no, but, ever I mean, made. Years, I'm talking about years before. You know, yeah, yeah, no. NT3.1 and, and NT351 Daytona uh, were both... They were, they were huge and heavy and expensive and... And you they, wanted them. I wanted them bad, but you know, on the on the PCs you would have at the time, my first actual IBM compatible computer, my not my wife's computer, but mine was a like an AMD 386SX style thing. You know, it was a, a little piece of junk, and there was no way you could ever run an NT. Oh, on such somebody's a pointing out that they did do an NT for DEC Alpha that was 64 bits. Yes, so the, right. Another part of the strategy that kind of went by the wayside until fairly recently again is that NT was designed to be cross-platform. So it wasn't just the DEC Alpha, but uh, well, the 64-bit version was DEC, I guess. But um, you know, they had a MIPS version and they had a Power PC version, right? Um, they probably sold two or three copies of each of those, and 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 they were all dropped over time. I mean, as as NT and the Windows line merged. You know that cross compatibility thing, which seemed like a hedge against the future, because who know who knew where the competing market was going? I think by the time these later systems came out, they kind of knew where the market was going, and that was less important. And the other thing I would say is that when you're writing something to be cross uh, platform compatible, that's the reason it's so big and heavy because it can't be optimized right. easily right. for any one platform, right? Um, when they stopped doing that, and when they started writing more and more assembly language that was very specific to the underlying platform. It got faster and faster, but it also got less, you know, cross-platform. That was one of the interesting things in the conversation yesterday with the guy who did uh, uh, the original BIOS for... Uh, <laughs> That's a good... <laughs> the, what? There he is. What, what are you talking about? I finally noticed the picture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, 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 what are you, what, what are you, you know, talking Leo, about? You know, Leo, I'll rip off Dennis Miller and say, if you just had a Cheshire cat and a monocle, <laughs> you'd be a James Bond villain. <laughs> Wait a minute, I can make this work. Hold on. <laughs> I've completely I've lost control of the show. Um, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. <laughs> we have we have switcher failure. We have switcher failure. So getting right back to where we were before this guy intruded. Yep. Um, NT and N Windows 95, kind of yeah. 98. You know, they were in the market at the same time. You know, kind of merged, though. Microsoft, I remember Microsoft explicitly. Well, eventually they merged. I mean, there was, there was actually a couple of things that happened before that. Okay. I, mean, I didn't, I didn't um, want to speed you up. I, let's hear them all. No, no, it's, it's okay. I know. It's just, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I remember NT4 was the first version I could run, right? Um, either, I think computers maybe just caught up. I don't know that there was any particular huge optimization oh, just, there necessarily. But, but it was NT5 was 2000, right? And that's the one. NT5 became I Windows I think 2000. many Windows users agree. In fact, right up to Windows 7, that that yeah. was the version you wanted to be running was Windows 2000. Am I wrong? Yeah, no, you're not wrong. I, I think the only thing I would hedge a little bit there is that um, 
you know, there were always these problems. You know, the, the Windows NT side was always more secure and stable. Right. and really No blue screens, right? Yeah. I mean, I, as a developer, and, and again, you know, writing Delphi applications, I could crash a Windows 9X computer very easily. Easy. But on Windows NT, this, these applications well, would not crash. It had the ring OS, zero right? memory protection. You couldn't. That was write impressive to... in the day. That was impressive. Yeah, it was. It was rock solid. Now, somebody in the chat room saying, "Yeah, but not for gamers." And yeah, don't you remember? Of course not. How no, horrible not. it was in Windows ninety five days. You try to run yep. Doom, which was yep. a DOS game in a wind. Oh my God, it was a nightmare. And that that's, how, yeah. that's how. Yeah. That's how DirectX, I, I think, started. Life to, has to, to progress, but yeah, there's always this, you know, that compatibility thing. I mean, there are workarounds to these things. You know, uh, Quake. Uh, you know. They wrote a Windows shell for that. Oh, so you so could, horrible. Quake was actually a DOS game, but right. there was a WinQuake version. And, uh, there was an OpenGL version. And, and It's funny. Uh, now you can play Doom on, like, your iPod. <laughs> uh, you could play Doom <laughs> in a web browser. Well. It's, uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, I know, but this was a big deal in the day. No, I mean, it it's, it's important to remember that. That's a long time ago. Um, you know, Microsoft progressed the Windows 9X stuff, you know, 98, and the OSR versions of Windows 95, and even Windows Millennium Edition, but... Yeah, I mean, the Windows NT 5.0, which became 2000, was going to be the big unification right. time period. Now, it didn't actually end up becoming that. But they did, that they first, had these two tracks, and they wanted to, to, to merge them into a single... It just couldn't do it quickly enough, I think, was the issue. Was so XP, the XP is really the time when that happened. But there was a, there was a reviewer's workshop, and I, I distinctly remember this, um, because it was such a hot topic of the time. And it's so funny, because you can't remember any of these technologies... There used to be something in Windows 98 called Web TV for Windows. It was a, well, it is exactly what it sounds like, a way to watch TV shows in Windows. And I remember somebody asked the guy in the reviewer's workshop, so you're saying that Windows, 2, uh, Windows NT5 at the time is going to be a complete superset of Windows 98 and of Windows uh, NT4? And the guy said, yeah. And, he, and someone said, so that means Web TV for Windows is going to run on this thing. And he said, Absolutely. And that never happened. You know, it's just, it's just never happened. I mean, Windows 2000 was not that thing. So they ended up promoting or um, uh, pushing Windows 2000 as a business solution, you know, for uh, their enterprise customers. And then they had Windows Millennium Edition, which they pushed it at consumers. And then finally in XP, that was when they dropped the 9X stuff and when we just went NT. But, and I know, remember, you know, because I was using Windows 2000, when XP came out, it really felt like a kiddie kind of uh, almost a, you know, Fisher-Price yeah, interface yeah, compared yeah, yeah. to 2000. Well, uh, Windows 2000 was tough because it was so, it was technically obviously NT, but they dropped the name, which always killed me. I, right. I always felt like the NT name stood for something and that, you know, they had that stupid message on the screen where it was like Windows 2000 powered by NT technology. Right. You know, and it's like, oh, screw you guys. You know, this was like the marketers winning but aren't you know, we the, still the NT kernel? I mean, isn't it? It's it's the oh, NT yeah, yeah. kernel, right? Absolutely. But the other problem with this release was, and this actually happened in the NT4 time frame, was that, you know, Internet Explorer came along. And they started artificially requiring you to install Internet Explorer on the server even, or in NT generally, if you wanted to get other features of the OS that would be released after the OS. So, for example, if you wanted to get the Internet Information Services um, web server, which was a package, I think like an action pack or whatever they call it, an option pack at the time. Oh, uh, I was love the old plus packs. Remember those? Yeah. But those you, had, you had to get the browser. <laughs> and then when you got to Windows 2000, of course, it was integrated right into the OS. And that artificial integration, aside from the antitrust implications, introduced a technical flaw into Windows that in some ways persists to this day, although they've now componentized Windows enough that... Um, you know, the the UI bits of IE are, are separated from the core bits and, you know, yada, yada, yada. But, I mean, at the time, they took this system that was, you know, kind of pristine technically, and they put this junk in it that had been written by a bunch of kids who were fresh out of college, and they kind of compromised it, you know. And so Windows 2000, there were elements to it that I always felt a little wrong about, you know. And then, like you said, XP came around, and it's like blue mm -hmm. and green and you know, it's kind of. I always went back to the like, Windows Classic. It's the first thing I did. A do. lot of people did. I, let, yeah. I bet a lot of businesses did. And it's funny because Windows XP ended up being in the market for so long. I'm still I using it on half the machines I'm sitting in front of yeah, right now. Absolutely. Uh, it's still kind forget, of the default version. Right. So people forget how it was perceived at the time, right? A, a lot of people hated the way it looked. 
Yeah. The people who liked the way it looked felt a little ripped off because Microsoft early on was talking about having all these different color schemes and we're going to release all these different color schemes via free downloads. And they never did. It, it shipped with blue. Well, not really. I mean, there were a couple, but they shipped with, you know, blue and green. And then there was like the silver one. And then there was kind of a weird light green one. And those were the only ones that they ever got matched up right, you know. And it, it, what it reminds me of is uh, cars. You know, if you, if you think about the way a car is made, there are these fender things that they kind of weld onto the sides of the, the box of the car. But they may be made out of a different material than the other part of the car. So when they paint the car, they have to be careful to use paint that will look like the same color across all the different pieces. Actually, it's this problem Apple has when they try to make a white iPhone. It's the same deal. They can't get it to match up. You apply paint to different types of materials, and it looks like different colors because the underlying material absorbs some of the paint and changes the color. Um, the Windows XP user interface was just like that. They, they thought early on they were going to offer all these different colors. And what they found was it's really hard to make colors that look okay across all the different UIs in Windows XP. So they ended up not really ever doing it. I mean, there was one for Media Center they did later on called Royale that was really nice. And then they did a, a Zoom one that you could just download for free that was basically black, but fine. But they never really kind of came through on that. So, uh, and the other thing that, you know, we talked about before too with XP was that when XP came out, there was this massive UPnP vulnerability right away. And this system oh, God, was so yeah. poorly constructed from a security standpoint that Microsoft actually stopped development of Windows for months at a time. So they could not just fix Windows XP, but redo the way that they develop software to be more secure across the board, you know? I mean, uh, and of course we forget this now because, you know, XP was in the market forever. Um, but, you know, it didn't really launch uh, in a very positive way. And I think it's important to kind of go back and remember that a little bit. I forgot about that, yeah. Yeah, everyone does. I only remember the thing, the negative, and I guess we were doing the screensavers by then. Negative for us there was the Fisher Price interface, you know? It was just the yeah. those big I mean, grew, colorful buttons that were just. I grew know. to like that. And, and you know, the I point I, I made. To it. I point the point I made in um, in the article I was referencing earlier is that if if you if you go back to Windows ninety five and you look at all of the OSs that have come ever since and up to Windows seven you know all the XP versions they did Windows Vista which added glass you know Windows XP added the blue stuff like glass you said is sweet glass is sweet but fundamentally speaking from a UI perspective start button start menu taskbar tray desktop they're all exactly the same I mean. Remember in office, we used the phrase, um, putting lipstick on a pig. Yeah. You know, in many ways, that's what this stuff is. Now, you can make arguments for why each of these is nice in some ways. You know, uh, Windows Vista added glass, and it lets you look below the windows and to see what's down there. And, uh, yep, fair enough. You can do that. But, you know, ultimately, we're talking about the same exact UI, you know. And when I um, discuss, you know, the evolutionary nature of what Apple's done with OS X, I think it's also fair to discuss the evolutionary nature of what Microsoft has done with Windows over the past 15 years, which is basically take that desktop UI, which, as you noted, Apple had in 1984. It's the same freaking thing, right? It really is. Yeah. It's the same thing. It's a desktop with floating Windows on top of it. You know, Microsoft formalized some Windows-specific UI features, like I said, the Start button and the Taskbar, Start menu. But ultimately, we're talking about a desktop metaphor that has existed, uh, you know, since 1984. I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing. So even though XP seems like it was really different, and even though Windows Vista seems like it was very different, I mean, you could sit in front of a Windows 95 computer, and you may, you know, laugh at how archaic some of it may seem, but you would be able to get around that thing no problem because it works basically the same exact way. I guess that's true of, of all modern operating systems. You could use, for most people, yeah. sit down on, at a Linux desktop, at a Mac desktop, sure. or a Windows desktop, and they'd get it pretty quick. Mm -hmm. there, yeah. I mean, there really is yeah. a f kind of a fundamental, there are minor differences, but the fundamental yeah. understanding of how, uh, how a computer works these days, it's, it's is, all pretty It's very uh, common, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the, the bit That's why that it's Windows don't... 8 is interesting, why the iPad is interesting. It, it, it's the first time we've had a fundamental change since Windows uh, 95. Yeah, and when I, when I describe that as scary and exciting, I mean, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. I mean, you get out of your familiar box, and it's like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, you get a little, you know, you get a little weird about it. But, you know, b behind the scenes do, during all this, there's been a lot of work, and I'm never going to be able to touch on all of it, but I'll just highlight a couple of ones I can think of off the top of my head that, you know, Microsoft doesn't get a lot of credit for because we just kind of forget um, uh, probably Windows 95 timeframe, post Windows 95, there was something 
called the game. I think it was called the Games SDK or the Games Windows SDK, which turned into DirectX, right? Which of course has evolved over the years. And you know, making a game for Windows is no longer the disaster that it was back when people were still running. You know, do going into DOS to play games. When, well, when they, had to, they had to solve that. Otherwise, you right. wouldn't have been able to play games. You'd be, you, there is no DOS anymore. Yeah, but those uh, that work, just as probably on the Apple side, too, in some ways, you know, their, their work with uh, QuickTime and all of their media stuff, Open you know, yeah. translates into, yeah, into these UI conventions uh, later down the road, which is kind of interesting. Uh, Microsoft did a lot around UIs with things like Windows Media Center, which evolved over several versions, the tablet PC stuff, the ultra mobile PC stuff. Related projects that everyone forgets about, like smart displays, uh, portable media centers, uh, Zune, all this stuff. You know, th these things all, um, you know, influence things over time. It's funny, you know, some of the Windows 8 stuff is interesting because you can see little bits of all of those things I just mentioned in there. And I think that's interesting, you know. Um, someone today just wrote me an email and said... Um, we have all these XP machines. We want to go to Windows 7, but we rely on Windows NetMeeting to communicate during the day. I had to go look this thing up. I remember NetMeeting sort of. I never really used it. And I had to go, I, I had to look up what were the capabilities of this thing and try to figure out what, you know, how do you do this in Windows 7? There's no direct analog, but, uh, you know, it's funny that the direct Microsoft answer to that question involves such things as, you know, Windows Live Mesh and Remote Desktop and all this stuff that's just kind of built into Windows or built into Windows Live, at least. Um, but, you know, things evolve, like the Web TV for Windows. I bet people forget that even existed, but you can go look it up. Um, what what you know, was Web TV for Windows? Was that a precursor? Sort of, to it, precursor to Media Center. Media Center, okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, all of this leading up to the brand new shiny Windows 8, and now I guess we have a ship date. <laughs> What are you laughing well, at? Well, I don't know if we have a ship date, but we have a ship. Yeah. A ship we have a due premonition date. there. <laughs> it it yeah. will be here sometime in the fall of next year. Yeah, basically a Microsoft executive was interviewed by the Seattle... I'm going to get this wrong. I'm sorry. Uh, Seattle Times or the Seattle PI? Seattle Times. The Seattle PI is gone, isn't it? Yeah, I think the, the PI, PI is, is, the, is the paper of, uh, of choice, the post-intelligence. Now, now what are we doing here? I don't know. It seems to be some sort of QR code. I'm sorry. I must have pushed the button wrong. <laughs> it's like the CNN presidential debate. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what this Q? I don't know. I'm sorry. No, I what is it? Distract I, people. But you know what that QR code says? No. I'm not going to tell you. you just it looks like an 8-bit graphic from a video game. Doesn't it? Yeah. Scan it, folks. You find out. Um Oh, he wants to do it. Wait a minute. Somebody in our in our uh, studio wants to scan. Here, just take a picture of that there. there you can have it. You, I don't really need to hold it. Uh, so the PI, you were saying? Or the Times. Or the Times. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still around. Him. In the context of E3, interviewed a guy from the Xbox Live Services uh, team and asked him about E3, but then he kind of got into Windows 8 a little bit, and what he admitted was something that uh, corresponds with what I've been saying for some time now, which is that uh, with Xbox Live services are going to be built into Windows 8. And I'm sorry, I got off on the wrong, we're on the wrong topic, aren't we? This no, I skipped date. a topic. I went over to the Windows due in fall 2012. Then we'll, well get these back two, these to two things are semi related. The so developer separately, conference. two Microsoft executives have said that, yeah, you know, in the context of timing, that we're going to have, you know, they're going to have the build conference in September and then 12 months later, a release following what they did with Windows 7, which is exactly what I've been saying all along that, you know, if you know Steven Stanofsky and you know the way he works, you can do the math on the dates. And, you know, we've talked about this many times. So he basically just... Uh, it's not a surprise, in other words. No, but it's someone from Microsoft saying it, so that's always interesting. Um, the other one regards the Xbox Live services. You know, I've been talking about Microsoft's internal plan to uh, de-emphasize and demote and then eventually get rid of uh, the Zune brand. And uh, instead of that, use some brand within Microsoft that was more popular. And I... Um, guessed at the time that that would probably be Xbox, you know, because Xbox is their only popular consumer brand, essentially. And that does appear to be the case. So Microsoft uh, corporate vice president said that uh, Xbox Live would be the media services vehicle for Windows 8. It would be built into Windows 8. And that raises some interesting questions around what 
applications will be available, what services will be available. I've, got, I've heard from a lot of Windows Media Center users. In fact, maybe all of them. Um, wondering if Windows Media Center is going to be killed off or is that still going to be included in Windows 8? And, we, you know, we don't know. I mean, I... 90% of the questions I get about Windows 8, I just I, I just don't know. I can't say. Right. I have no idea. So right. They've only told us a very small amount. Right. It's a, it was, we, what we saw was basically, what, a developer preview kind of a thing. It was really just a little bit of the UI. It was the front end of the UI, but, right. you know, who knows what else they're changing, everything. I mean, so um, what we do know is that today in Windows 7, we built in our Windows Media Player, which is kind of a traditional media player application, all in one jukebox type of thing. Uh, there's Windows Media Center, which is the, you know, the 10-foot UI for, originally designed for the den, you know, the living room, you'd use it with a TV. I, I really feel strongly that putting a computer in your living room is a bad idea, and that I, I know very few people, from a percentage standpoint, actually do that. The people who do do it love it, and I, I understand that, because Windows Media Center is awesome, but it just doesn't seem like the optimal, efficient way to do it. And then, of course, Microsoft has a separate Zune software, so... Some of the conjecture is around, you know, will they consolidate all of these things into one application? Uh, would they get rid of all of them and maybe just have uh, Zune available as a download and not have anything built into Windows? You know, um, from a services standpoint, I would expect all of those things that we associate with Zune today, uh, Zune Marketplace, uh, Zune That's Pass, the best part of Zune, I think, is the Zune Marketplace, Yeah, right? these things, I would expect them to continue uh, just to be rebranded. Right. Uh, I know what people will they who call previously... It? Xbox. Xbox. So, okay. yeah, so, you know, one of the questions and answers I, I had seen was, well, okay, so you're going to get rid of the Zune branding in, you know, in these Xbox Live services. So what do you call the media stuff? And what the guy said was, he goes, look, you know, when people go to music, they think of music. Yeah. They don't think Zune. They no. think music. Right. So we call it music. Right. You know, when people want to watch a TV show or rent a movie... Um, we, we call that videos, <laughs> you know, I mean, because that's, that makes sense to people. Uh, Zune doesn't resonate with people. They don't understand that that's what that means. So, well, I think they think as, uh, as, 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 a, as a device. Or that, even as a device. If, yeah, so if, if they do know what it means, they get confused right. because they don't have a Zune device and they're not going to buy one. And why would I go there? That's why I don't like podcasting. It's because it implies that you have an iPod. I mean, you, you don't want yeah. a hardware device name tied yeah, into this sure. stuff. Sure, sure, sure. Does it make sense? Yeah, so again, you know, unfortunately, as, as so often the case with this stuff, these things, these revelations open up lots more questions, and we just don't have the answers yet. So uh, I'll have to keep pushing a lot of this stuff off to the same thing, which is simply that in September, Microsoft is having this big conference. I expect them to have a reviewer's workshop at that time. I expect them to provide reviewers with pre-release versions of the OS and to fully divulge everything that is Windows 8 and that either right that day or sometime within days of that, we will be able to tell that to the world, and, and then we'll know. But it is, what, July, you know, August, September, three months away. Right. So, cool. sorry. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know. We don't know. Hey, we're going to take a break, come back with more. You have your thoughts on Duke Nukem Forever and mm -hmm. a one-year anniversary to celebrate. Uh, Paul Therat is here, editor-in-chief of the Supersite for Windows, when supersite.com, this show as always, brought to you by the good folks at Citrix. I don't know what we'd do without them. Citrix was started by Ed Iacobucci, who was on that original OS2 team. He worked for IBM and was sent to, my, to Redmond to work on NT. End up knowing more about the guts of Windows than any Microsoft employee, and that's why Citrix Enterprise is still considered the gold standard for remote access for Windows. Microsoft licensed it for RDP. It's what people use, and Citrix makes some great consumer products based on that same idea, including... Go to Assist Express. Now, if you're in IT or a, a software support, if you have clients, even family and friends who need support, go to Assist Express is a lifesaver. I've been using it for more than 10 years now. It just gets better and better and better. The current version is so cool because not only do you have that 128 bit SSL, completely secured connection to a remote computer so you can fix it, but you can use it on a Mac or a PC, fixing a Mac or a PC. You can do eight sessions at the same time. You might say, why would I want to do that? Well, m you know, you can start an install on one, an update on another, a scan on a third, and keep moving. So it makes you much more productive. You can tell what operating system is running. You can tell what software is going on in the background. You can drag and drop fixes and patches from your computer to theirs. You can even show them what's on your computer. I'm, I'm trying to think of why you might want to do that, but you can. Well, you could be running, you know, I don't know, you'd be running Windows 7, fixing a Mac, saying, hey, hey. Anyway, the whole... <laughs> 
This is what it's supposed to look like. The whole, the whole thing is this is flexible, it's fa powerful, it's fast, and it's free for the next 30 days. If you go right now to go to assist dot com slash windows 30 days free they have day passes for people who only do this occasionally and of course a monthly subscription for those of you in the business go to assist dot com slash windows there is no better way to do remote support I, I can state that unequivocally go to assist dot com slash windows and of course we thank them for their support of windows weekly it's been a year since office 2010 that's kind of hard to believe yep no yet, hat, we no, uh, no noisemaker? Do you want me to break out the Vuvuzela? It's tough. It's office productivity, you know. <laughs> what to say. I, I, the one, you know, in keeping with our history theme today, I guess I would just point out that, um, you know, this ribbon UI that they debuted in Office 2007, actually, and then uh, made better and more pervasive in Office 2010, is yet another one of those really controversial things. It really has people on other, you know, one side of the fence or the other. Um, but the one thing that people can't deny, because Microsoft has the metrics to prove it, is that this thing has made people more productive in the sense that in previous versions of Windows, of the top 10 requests for new features, I want to—I think it was 9 out of 10 were features that were already in Office, but people didn't know they were there because they were so well hidden. Whereas the Office, uh, the ribbon UI, uh, exposes this functionality in a far uh, better way and has made people more productive. I, I, I happen to love it. And well, well let's you know, celebrate. I, I, what do you say? Okay. It's like a, a flatulent camel has entered the office. Right in your ear. It's sad. <laughs> It's just sad. It's, 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 I'm just trying to bring some happiness into the lives of people who use Office. That's all, Paul. Let me do it again. No, oh, jeez. <laughs> all right. You can call this episode, sorry, I had Mexican <laughs> for lunch. Next story. Moving on. Or unless there's anything else to say, 50 million. No, just some numbers users. around Office. Uh, they, 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 what they've, what they've said is that they. Let's see, what is it? Uh, it's got numbers. 750. I'm sorry, 750 million users. That's amazing. Well, it's. Um, I don't remember if it was one, one. It must be one per second or one per. Wow. They've sold one copy, yes, of Office every second that it's been available since last year. So 31 million it, units. Yeah, I do the math on that. It's about 31 million. Um, they say that there are over 750 million active users of all available Office versions worldwide and over 1 billion instances of Office installed on PCs, which suggests a lot of people don't know they have it or don't need it, I guess. Um, you know, three out of four companies in the U.S. Uh, with over 500 computers use Exchange, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, there's a lot of numbers. But I, I think the, the the big one is, you know, Office 2010 is the best-selling version by far, the best-selling version with um, uh, both consumers and businesses. Businesses have deployed this thing like five times faster than the previous version. Um, but for all of that stuff, I think the most interesting statistic might have been about the Office web apps. They said that they have over 50 million active users of the Office web apps, which are these free web-based versions of Word, Excel, OneNote, and PowerPoint. And that's about double uh, the, the figure of what Google previously said uh, was using Google Docs. So um, with just a year on the market, they've apparently already pulled ahead of that. Well, so, I mean, it's still the gold standard. I mean, you can't, I mean, it's just, if you're doing know, Office, yeah. you, you got to have Microsoft Office. You just have to, even yeah. on a Mac. And that's the thing, you know, it, this thing, obviously, it's available as a Windows suite. There's a Mac version of the suite as well. There is a, uh, a web version. There is um, a version for Windows Phone and a new version coming in Mango. Um, there are some Office apps and other mobile platforms, you know, OneNote most primarily. But I'm really hoping that by the end of the year, a year from, you know, within the next 12 months or whatever, that we'll see iOS versions especially, but perhaps also Android versions of all of these office apps. Mm, that would be nice. Right, native on those platforms. You know, for people who have iPads or iPhones or whatever. I mean, I, Office is, I, Office would just shut down everything else, I would think. I mean, with the exception of, I, I know there's this community of people that really likes things like Keynote on the Mac or whatever, but um, I really believe that 
You're so dismissive. It's actually pretty nice. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm not. I'm, I'm not dismissive. I, 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 what I mean by that is, I know that the people who use it love it. I, I don't really think it's that big of a community overall. It's kind no, of like in fact, that's one of the reasons I love it because it because everybody's been well, seeing no, PowerPoint it's... presentations and they keep go, oh, it's something else. It's something different. It looks different. Well, but I, 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 I so please don't use it. it. I use Keynote as an example because actually that's the one of those apps I'd say probably has some value. It looks like it's pretty decent. I mean, oh yeah, it's great. The other ones I don't quite understand the point of, but um, but anyway, I, I you know I think Microsoft would be wise to put their best-selling software on as many platforms as possible and kind of go back to their roots. You well, know, isn't that what Office 365 is all about? I mean, doesn't that put it everywhere? That puts it on the web, but the web isn't everywhere. you got to remember, you know, the, the computing platforms of the future are web and native mobile apps. Yeah. I, I, I really don't think it's a an all or the other kind of thing. I think it's going to be split between those two basic um, methods of delivery. So web is good, but native apps are always better, you know. Um, Maybe someday in the future that will be not the you know not the case. I don't know, but I I do believe that they need uh, iOS especially. Um, well, that version. would be awesome. Yeah, because we really don't have. I mean, I think there's third party apps you can buy that will. There are, and I've tried them all. They're all lousy in their own right. way. You know, Quick right. Office and all the different uh, sort of Office, <laughs> you know, apps that they have. You know, whatever. They're okay, but. Speaking of Nothing. iOS, uh, I guess Apple's going to pay a big chunk of money to Nokia for the right. Uh, this, yeah. this patent loss has been going on for years. What do you think about this one? I, 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 you know, there's been a big debate over who wins here. Um, well, how could it, I mean, Nokia's is estimated. I mean, they're going to do one big lump sum, which Nokia coyly said will affect our bottom line. And then well, uh, regular and We're going to find out what that means, by the way, because we, no, we've already seen what they've estimated. So hundreds of millions, like 300 million, right? We're thinking several hundred million yeah. Yeah, dollars. Big That's pretty chunk. significant. Yeah. Not big from, you know, Microsoft standards. No, Apple burps and that much money comes out of them. I Apple's understand. Got, from Apple's I perspective, what, it's nothing. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think this is an acknowledgement by, well, probably what this is, is saying... I don't know what it is. I mean, it, I guess it's... <laughs> you know, it's hard to say. Like It's capitulation. The, I don't see how you could say was, that... Is it, I mean, like, what was the impetus for this? In other words, uh, every mobile company on earth is suing each other, right? right? Oh, the, it's a The mess. matrix of who's suing who would be like this crazy spider web. It is. Point. Somebody made an uh, infographic. Yeah. It's nuts. Yeah, you can tell. It would be crazy. So, of all those things, all of a sudden, Apple settles with Nokia. Really? I mean, Apple is not the kind of company that settles. Yeah, I know. You know? I, I, I'm really confused by this, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's I, maybe I think an there's... acknowledgement that Nokia is merely a patent holding company from now on. I don't know. Yeah, well, yes, yes, there's some truth to that, certainly. I mean, you know, Apple, uh, of course, my, uh, Nokia's uh, explanation of this makes it look very pop, you know, a po hello, very positive for Nokia. Apple's, of course, downplayed, you know, the extent of it. They said something like, uh, you know, that this doesn't cover any of the the majority of the innovation that makes the iPhone unique. But, you know, these Nokia patents, there are 46 of them. They cover a crazy range of features in smartphones that we associate with all smartphones, including such things, by the way, as having a built-in app store and the methods by which a touchscreen responds to swiping gestures. I Sounds mean, like they got them, frankly. Yeah. I mean, those are, those are pretty core features. And now, they're core features of all smartphones today, of course. Uh, but acknowledging that Nokia owns those is very interesting and I think sets up Nokia to sue other companies like Rim and Google and the makers of uh, exactly. Google handsets. I mean, that's hey, why really, not? You know, This is the beginning of, the, of uh, open trench warfare or something. Yeah. So I see this as kind of a wash because I think that uh, Apple can very easily afford this. So from their perspective, it's like, screw it. You know, we can afford a per unit... Uh, vig or whatever and from rim's perspective they need the money and now this opens up the possibility that they can get this money from other companies you know one of whom by the way is selling more phones than apple is so that, that could be an interesting revenue stream i mean for some companies that would be enough just to be a very successful company in your own right right there without even selling a single phone of your own i suppose if you want the uh, infographic it's at bit.ly bitly slash so sue me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> and you can see all the... Uh, it, it, of course, you're going to have to update it now because they're going to have to take Nokia and Apple out. But, boy, there's still lots of other lawsuits going on. Yep. 
It leads it's off. nuts. I mean, it's, it seemed it, for a couple of years there, it seemed like almost every day it was a story. HTC is suing this company, yeah. or Motorola is suing this company, or Motorola is being sued by this company. You know, they these guys all cross suit each other. Here's the uh, here's the spreadsheet. <laughs> nice. <laughs> It's crazy, baby. Yeah. Well, you look, you see, we saw this in the PC world. We talked about the UIs and how you could easily move back and forth between Mac and Windows, for example. Um, obviously, uh, smartphones today all have these common features, including the two I just mentioned. You know, you expect that as a baseline. The thing is, someone owns that. And it's not always the company that made the phone that you were using. So, right. uh, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting. There's going to be a lot of cross-paying, I think. <sighs> I, I I usually don't. Be honest, I don't cover lawsuits because no, because they it's go on for years. Uh, they're very arcane and technical, but occasionally they there there's some something to say about that. Yeah. So uh, we talked about this yesterday on this week in Google. The first Chromebooks are theoretically available or were available yesterday. Not easy to get yeah. them, including the ones that people want, like the, the least expensive models. Have you yeah. have you played with so, one of these yet? Here's, yeah, here's what I did. I, I have a, a Chrome, you know, the CR48. Right. The original one. That's, that's, um, that's functionally equivalent to a Chromebook. It's just not the hardware. Right. So the day that Amazon uh, put these machines up for sale, I pre-ordered a... Samsung with 3G. And then I, because it didn't come right away because it was a pre order, I thought about it and I said, you know what? I don't need this thing. Yeah, I think you were this wise. Is, I was going to say, this is dumb. <laughs> That's taking a bullet and, and, for the team. I, yeah, I so, wouldn't take. <laughs> yeah, so here was my thought I can review Chrome OS without having the box because I have a box that runs right. the latest version of Chrome OS. Right. So actually, I'd hope to have that review up before we started. I just missed it. So Sometime later today, I'll post my review. But so I'm not going to review the actual hardware. But that's fine. Frankly, it's not that different anyway, right? I mean, we know that they it's have. It's a netbook, right? It's dual, yeah, it's a dual core Atom. It's a netbook, but it has a 13 inch screen in this case, right? Right. And the smaller versions have 11.6 inch screen. So they're, they're bigger hardware. They're, they're, they're sized more like notebooks or ultra portable machines, you know, ultra portable computers. They have a very limited amount of RAM, uh, sorry, of, um, storage. You know, it's flash storage. It's um, supposed to be like, a cloud. It's all cloud. We don't, you know, you're not supposed to save anything on your computer. The problem is, uh, and the benefit is, that these things will be updated all the time. And right now what you're getting is something that doesn't work unless you're online at all. Right. And if you're on a plane and you don't have Wi-Fi in the plane or you don't want to pay for Wi-Fi in the plane, what that means is you are carrying around a three or four or five pound, whatever it is, piece of plastic because you can't even open that thing and edit a text document. No. You can't do anything right now. Now that's going to change. Uh, eventually this summer they say Google is going to add offline capabilities to their apps. You know, things like Gmail, Google Calendar, I think Picasso Web was mentioned, as well as third-party apps. And they said something along the lines of all games. But I can tell you right now, you could try to reload Angry Birds in that thing when you're offline. It won't do anything. It, it does. Oh, that's it's, interesting. You can't. It's a doorstop. It doesn't uh, work. Uh. So that's a problem. Um, the other problem, I think, is just the price. You know, the, the machine that I ordered, the one with 3G, is $500. And for $500, you're talking about, a, that's the average selling price, by the way, of a PC laptop. And whatever you think of Windows, all I'm saying is this. Everything you can do in Chrome OS, you can do on Chrome in Windows. Or plus, any computer, even on a, <laughs> right, on any, Linux know, box. Talk, yeah, okay. but I mean, Because all you, you get on, is a browser. Right. So... Everything that it can do, basically, is available in Chrome. Yeah. And I would also point out that there are features you get using Chrome under Windows that you don't get of course. in Chrome OS. The ability to run windowed application windows. The ability to uh, put a shortcut to an app on your taskbar and have it be something meaningful as a separate application, you know. And then all the local stuff. I mean, they've tried to bridge the gap in some ways. There, there, there's a way to acquire photos off of a card. There's a... Um, mm. Yeah, stuff like that. But, you know, you can't even use the thing. I mean, I, there must be a way to jury rig this or there will be eventually. But, you know, you couldn't even load a movie on an SD card and watch it on this thing, you know. So I, now on the positive side, I will say the thing cold boots in seconds, which is crazy. It is instant on on resume, as you would expect, a la an iPad. Um, it does get great battery life. Even the CR48 that I have gets something like seven, seven and a half hours of battery life. I mean, it's really good. And I hear the... The Samsung that they have now in market is better, eight plus hours. 
Um, it comes with some, if you get the 3G version, you get a no contract Verizon. Well, actually, you do get a contract for free Verizon for two years, 100 megabytes a month. And then you can buy bandwidth from Verizon in chunks without signing up for a contract. That's pretty cool. Um, that would be a lot more valuable on a PC, let me tell you. <laughs> That's the only thing. I mean, I just... It's neat, but I wish I could get that deal on a, on a Windows PC. That'd be good. Um, because, you know, sometimes you just need your, your, the hotel Wi-Fi stinks or you're in a place that doesn't have Wi-Fi. And yes, I would pay $10 right now for 100 megabytes of uh, 3G connection, connectivity or whatever. You know, that'd be nice. You can buy USB cards, by the way, that do that. Like Virgin, Virgin Mobile does that. But it'd be nice to have it built right in. So I, I just don't... You know, in the same way that I would give anyone else, any other tech company credit for kind of seeing the future, I, I think there are bits of Chrome OS that make a lot of sense. Um, but the, the line I used in the notes was simply that, you know, when you're, a, when you're a hammer, when you make hammers, everything looks like a nail. You know, and Google is a web services company. So everything they see becomes like a website or a web service or whatever, or web browser in this case. And that's really not how the world works. You know, mm -hmm. even though it's, it's familiar, but it's so limiting. Yeah. It's like you have a web browser, but it takes up the whole screen and you can't get behind it. You know, um, it's so, it's, it's such a weird feeling. I know it's like, you want to go, okay, let yeah. me close that screen. No, can't. Nope. Yeah. You, you know, the taskbar must be hidden. Let me move the mouse to the bottom nope. to make it show up. And no, it's <laughs> not there. There's nothing there. It, it's like in the, you know, we talked about program manager, you know, one of the tricks in windows three, one was you could replace the shell by, going into one of the any files, I can't remember which one anymore, WinNe or the other one, and uh, you could replace progman.exe with another executable program name, and when you booted the computer, Windows would launch, and that application would run as, not as the shell, but as the only thing running. And that's what Chrome OS is. It's like, uh, replace uh, progman.exe with uh, chrome.exe, and then reboot the computer, and it boots into Chrome, and then you're kind of stuck with that. And, you know, it's okay for what it is, and if you're a big user of Google services, I guess. There's some value there, certainly. I, um, I, you know, we talk a lot about it on uh, This Week in Google because I, frankly, am very skeptical. But I think the market for this is the, it's for maybe for education. It's, it's anywhere you want to constrain, a, where a, an authoritarian ent yeah. group wants to constrain what people can do with it. So a business where you really don't want your users doing anything but what you say, and sure. mostly that's on the intranet. Well, or as long school, as it's, but it, but it has to be web-based. You know, it that's has the to be web-based. I agree. And I, I I hear what you're saying, but you know, there are solutions for Windows and probably for the Mac that do the same thing. And I I just. But but it's, this is cheaper. This is this is twenty if bucks. If the price a month. was right, if the price was right. Well, yeah. and for schools, yeah, yeah. it's twenty bucks a month, including connectivity. I think there's a lot of schools who say, hey, you know, that's 180 bucks for the whole year. That's a good yep. deal. That's a good okay. deal. Okay. That's, I mean, but that's the, it's a very narrow audience. It's not a general I don't, purpose you know, computer. I, I, it's not a obviously we have full, we have full feature computers in the world. Mm -hmm. They can be complex. There's no doubt about it. Um, maybe they offer a little too much power, you know, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> is, that, is there such a thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, to the, from the perspective of a corporation trying to hedge in their right. users. Right. Um, and then we have this iPad thing and other tablets like it. And, and, I would get an iPad Listen, over a Chromebook. I would too, even though they they can be more expensive. But I think that even if you don't personally want an iPad, you have to at least admit, like this thing makes sense for people. Um, that if you're literally just going to answer the occasional email and mostly do kind of web browsing type stuff and like to play little kitschy games and whatnot, you know, the iPad is pretty good for that. It's a little expensive, I get it, but it's also weighs. I mean, almost nothing compared to a right. Chromebook. Right. It also gets, by the way, killer battery life. Right. Um, it's upgraded very aggressively. I think um, the biggest difference is the keyboard. But I'm saying for most people, the keyboard isn't. <laughs> I agree. You don't want a key. Most people don't need a keyboard. But that's I mean, why maybe a. Uh, you know, I've thought about the iPad for schools. You know, and uh, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, really yeah. for that you want a Chromebook or a, a, some sort of keyboard. For you want an eMate. <laughs> that's what Apple thought. Remember that? That was their Newton-based computer. Yeah, for you know schools. what? An e an mate had more going for it locally than a Chromebook. Yeah, that does, might be so. true. I mean, I don't know. So anyway, I, I appreciate the gesture. I kind of see where they're heading. I, right. I think the point is, they've done something that makes sense for them. Whether or not this makes sense right. for customers remains to be seen. I, I'm just arguing that Windows PCs and netbooks and iPads, I think, make sense for more people than Chromebooks do, and we'll see. Right. And we'll see what happens. I'm with you on that. Hey, coming up, I want to. I know you've played Duke Nukem forever. Mm -hmm. You took the hit, so we didn't have to. 
And we're going to talk yes, about sure. <laughs> we're going to talk about that <laughs> in just a little bit. But first, I want to mention briefly because I know most of you know about Netflix and are very well aware of what Netflix is. It's that great uh, system, so you can watch movies on your Xbox 360, your PS3, your Nintendo Wii, your Mac, your Windows, even your iPad. I mean, look at the even iPad. Even your Windows Phone, sir. Even Windows Phone. Is that I didn't I didn't know that really. Yep. That's awesome. I think the iPad's a really good example because it's a. Uh, let me zoom out here. It's a content consumption device, you know, really just the right size for... A per I've, I've often thought that the iPad is really a personal TV. Here it is on the phone. Here it is on the iPad. Here it is on your desktop. It's all kind of similar. You could get this for 30 days free. The app is free on the iPad. Uh, and uh, basically watch any movie you want. If you go to Netflix.com slash Twitch, should I play? Let me just play a movie. I don't think this will get us in copyright jail. If you go to Netflix.com slash Twit, try it free for 30 days. It's $7.99 a month, which is a great deal. You can cancel any time. You don't have any contract. It's not like a cable company. Uh, but do use Netflix.com uh, slash Twit when you sign up so that we get Paul gets credit for it. And, of course, uh, if you're already a member, look how fast that launched. And look how good that looks. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, Blade Runner, the theatrical cut. That's why it's such a widescreen uh, edition. Um, if, you would, if you've already got Netflix, I know many of you do, then you might want to tell a friend about this 30 days free, especially if they have a portable device, including the Windows phone. Netflix.com slash twit. I'm almost tempted to keep watching this movie. <laughs> I, have to, I have to say, it's really fun to be able to, when I get home, just not have to decide ahead of time, not have to get to the movie store or think or go on. I just press, I pick up, I do it on a Roku box. I pick up the remote. And I browse through. They have, you know, such a great selection all around. And uh, here's a hard day's night. It's just you, you always find something and go, oh, I didn't see that when it was in the theaters. Or, oh, I, I did and I loved it and I want to see it again. Or, you know, they've really done this nice job with the new interface at, uh, on, on the website, netflix.com slash twit. Look at that. It's like cover flow. It's pretty cool. <sighs> Edward James almost. I forgot he was in this movie. Emmett Walsh is so good in this. Of course, who, who doesn't love Daryl Hannah as the beautiful replicant? Oh, no, she, we know that. She's uh, What's her name? Cree, Free, Bree? What's her name? I can't remember. <laughs> Joanna Cassidy. Yeah, she's the, uh, she's the replicant with the uh, snake. Love her in this. Anyway, enough, enough watching Blade Runner. <laughs> It's Netflix is for movie lovers, and that's what's so fun about doing the doing the show and doing the ad. So, we all love Duke Nukem, 3D. Yep. We all love the original Duke Nukem because it was a kind of a wide open world you could wander around in, and it was kind of funny. What do you think, Duke Nukem Forever? You played it? Yeah, I haven't finished it. Um, Will you I finish it? Not. <laughs> that it is. It is one of the most disappointing games I've ever played in my life. Yeah. And I say that having known going in that it was going to be disappointing. It's just so childish and so terrible. And I, I like, how do you, what do you make of a game where only a child could laugh at the jokes, but then it's over the top with like nudity and excrement right. and stuff so that only an adult could actually play it. So, I mean, I'm not like a, I'm not like a, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm like a weird footloose parents, you know, no dancing in the town. You know, I, I just, it, it's so No, you don't want awful. your kid to play this. You really don't want your kid to play oh, this. Oh, no, no, no. I, no. In fact, Mark was home sick uh, the day I bought it. And, uh, you know, I told him, I said, look, we're only going to get one copy of this and you're not playing it. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I had to kind of explain it to him like, uh, you know, I this is just not, this is not happening. And it's all. I mean, it's just, it's so over the top. I mean, it's just I'm terrible. Sad. And it's just, it's not a good game. Well, you know, there are, the, there are these things that harken back to the original, which I appreciate. You know, they have all the things that you know and love from Duke Nukem 3D, the shrink ray and right. the trip mines and, you know, the pig cops and, you know, yada, yada, yada. And, and it's just, it's just a terrible game. It's just terrible. So yeah, my know, advice to you <laughs> is uh, do not buy this game. The, uh, the PR firm, the former PR firm. Yes. <laughs> for take this is two. actually really funny. So originally, 
So, of course, everyone reviewed this and everyone hated it. Yeah, I mean, basically. it was universally reviled. So the PR company representing the company that made the game actually went to these guys and threatened them and said, you they know. They tweeted it. Yeah, did it publicly like idiots. It's, this um, is the tweet from Jim Redner, who was the, uh, the, the founder of Redner Group, the PR firm. This is their his tweet. Too many went too far with the reviews. We are reviewing who gets games next time and who doesn't based on today's venom. Yeah, so saying Jesus. that anyone, like saying that someone else went too far oh. too often when you're talking about this oh. game is hypocritical uh, of the worst kind. But I mean, you know, this, I believe it because we were at E3 covering the game and we sent, we wanted to send cameras in to see the preview. It was coming out in a week. And they said, okay, but no commentary. You can't bring your microphones in. This oh. is the same. I'm pretty sure it's the same PR firm. Sure. And it's like, sure, sure, sure. really? It's that bad, huh? <laughs> it's really bad. It's really bad. And they kind of told us. I would just tell people, like, I, playing Duke Nukem 3D on the PC would be a waste of time because yeah. of, unless they, well, maybe they have a better Windows version now, but um, you can get this thing on Xbox Live, you know, Xbox Live Arcade. It's probably pretty cheap. I haven't looked at it recently. I do have it. I mean, play that one. Uh, yeah. Remember him as he was, Leo. Not <laughs> 14 as he years ago. <laughs> More than that. Uh, 15, oh, 16 years ago, Jeez. I think. 16? I don't know. It's 15. Yeah. Uh, whatever it is. It's By the way, just so, so, everybody, so we're clear that, that Take Two, the company that publishes Duke Nukem Forever, immediately fired. Oh, right. That's a, Yeah. And the then guy. they fired these guys. They That's fired beautiful. the PR firm saying, you can't say that. We yeah. we might agree with you, but you can't. Uh, say no, that. we we might even want you to say it, just not publicly right. on Twitter. Right. Do not you you can't admit that you will blacklist journalists for a bad review, even if we plan to. Yeah, crazy. <sighs> well, I didn't get it from them. I actually bought it. So there. I, I'm so upset about that. But this is exactly why I don't like getting free stuff in the first place. This is exactly <sighs> sure. the kind of deal with the devil. It's why I do buy stuff. Because yeah. it is it is a, a dual edged sword. Yeah, I don't want to hear these guys say you're never you're off the list, Laporte. Yep. Ridiculous. Not that anybody big like Apple would ever do that. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts? Uh, I see uh, uh, you're you're, you're uh, talking a little more about Windows Phone interoperability with the Google stuff here. Not just Windows Phone, but I, I guess Windows in, in general. I, I, I get these emails that uh, they're starting to connect in my head that maybe there's some interoperability discussion that needs to happen in the future. So I just wanted to throw this by people, which is, you know, someone wrote me and said, I want to use, I do use Gmail and Google Calendar and Google Contacts, but I want to use them in Windows uh, using Windows Live Mail. Is that possible? And the answer is no. Actually, it's not really possible. You can get Gmail in there, but there's no way to sync it right up with Google Calendar. I mean, you could do a dump of Google Calendar over to Hotmail. And then that's, that was that the in. main reason I stopped using the Windows phone. I could only get uh, one calendar in there. Yeah, so on the, all right, so on the calendar, I mean, that's on the uh, Windows phone side, now they're fixing that in Mango, but only for Microsoft solutions. So in the current version of Windows phone, if you have a, a Google Calendar or Exchange or Hotmail... I think that's it. Yeah, you can sync those calendars up, but only the primary calendar gets through the phone. Now, in Mango, if I'm understanding what I've seen uh, online, there's uh, they're supporting secondary calendars from Hotmail, which, by the way, mysteriously, uh, Windows Live Calendar at some point in, in the near past, I think, was renamed a Hotmail Calendar. I don't know if anyone out there knows when that happened. I actually, it was, I just noticed this recently. Um, it used to be called Windows Live Calendar, but now it's called Hotmail Calendar. Curiously, Windows Live Contacts is now called Windows Live Contacts, so they didn't change that one. But <laughs> there's Hotmail, and now there's Hotmail Calendar. Anyway, um, secondary calendars on Hotmail Calendar and secondary calendars on Exchange are going to work in Mango, from what I've been told. Uh, but if you have Google Calendar, I don't know. I don't, you know, I can't, I can't say yet. But I'm guessing no. I mean, um, so that's some weirdism. So. Uh, another instance would, you know, this has got to be a really tiny percentage of the population, but if for some reason you were using mobile me and, um, you were a windows user and you don't have outlook. So maybe you want to sync that stuff with, um, you know, windows live mail or on the phone to windows phone. Uh, there's no way to do that. And iCloud, I would assume is going to be the same based on the couple of windows programs they mentioned during the iCloud announcement. I think nothing's going to change there. And so I guess as a general statement, what I would say is. If you're on a Microsoft platform, if you're running Windows, 
and you're running a Windows Phone, uh, Microsoft stuff's going to work best. I mean, it's just the way it is. Um, but it's no different anywhere else. If you're on the Google stuff, uh, actually, Google does pretty well on iOS, but if you want the best experience, you want uh, Android on, on a mobile device. And the reason for that is simple. If you use Gmail, uh, and Leo, you use Gmail, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you know this. Um, G Gmail works differently than other email programs. Yes. And I, I, and, As and, does and, Hotmail, to be fair. I mean, both well, of them. It, well, no, no. I, I, G, Gmail is unique, and, and, and if you use it for a while, I think you might forget this. But most other email programs, you know, email servers have like this folder structure right. for your user account. Right. So there's there's an inbox, there's an outbox, or something they that is like an outbox but named differently. There are sent items, you know, that kind right. of thing. In Gmail, there's a view called inbox. It's not a folder. It's actually, and it's it's not really where your email is stored. It, and it and it works completely differently than the inbox does on other email programs. And by that I mean, on a on Hotmail or Exchange or I guess Yahoo Mail or whatever, you know, email goes in your inbox, and it's up to you. If you you can move it out of there, you can, you know, read it and delete it. You can read it and move it to like an archive folder or something. But inbox is where email goes. In in the Gmail world, you're your mail is in all mail, and inbox is like your unread mail. Your unarchived mail is actually the way to put it. So on an on an Android device, when you want to when you want to get rid of an email message from the inbox, you archive it. Right? It doesn't delete it. It just removes it from that view. Right? You know, it's a completely different way of doing things. And for that reason, even though you could integrate uh, Gmail very easily with iOS and use that mail application. You have to really think differently to use it. It's, I it's agree. A kind of a, it's yeah. a weird deal. So the, if you want to archive an email, what you have to do is click the move button and then select from the folder structure all mail. And that right. does the equivalent of uh, archive. Anyway, uh, the point here is simple. If you're using Gmail and Google Calendar, Google stuff works best. It's just the way it is. If you're using Microsoft stuff, their stuff works best. If you're using Apple stuff, their services, uh, email service and so forth, their stuff works best. The problem is for those people who need to mix and match. So I guess what I'm asking is, I, th the problem is there's, no, there's not going to be an answer for a lot of these questions, a lot of these combinations. You know, you use mobile me and you want to use Windows Live Mail. Will this work? The answer is no, right? But does there need to be a deeper examination of this, you know, because it could get really hairy. And I guess I'm just asking people if they have an opinion on that and if, if it's worth exploring. I, I, I feel bad for people because to a normal individual, to a, no, a normal person, you don't really think about all the little technical aspects of this. And the question is very simple. I, I'm, I happen to use Google Calendar. Why doesn't the, Google, you know, the calendar component of Windows Live Mail on Windows 7 work with that? You know? And I, I can't really answer the why I can just tell you that it doesn't work, and then I can offer some workarounds, none of which are acceptable. So, to, you know, <laughs> is there a broader discussion that needs to be had around this? I don't know. No, so, I agree with you. It's, uh, it's a little disappointing. That's, yeah. But that's why I use an Android phone, to be honest. Because that's, that's you, the functionality are, I need. Yes. I mean, uh, and even, you know, Windows Phone works the same way that uh, an iPhone does with this regards. So I use Gmail on, the, on Windows Phone, and I read any, you know, by opening an email, it marks it as read. But to get it out of inbox, which again on Gmail is a view, I have to click move. Well, actually, I have there to click the command bar button to bring up the thing, then right. move, and then select the folder. Right. Or, you know, it's not really a folder, but it looks like a folder. Um, it's complicated. It just, you know? it, I mean, I think everything that you want to do is doable, but you have to kind of do it differently. It takes some thinking. <laughs> and you're right, on mobile platforms, there's often a disconnect because they just don't have ways to well, do it. And then, unfortunately, on everything screen, you want to do is not doable. <laughs> That's the problem. Well, I mean, yeah. There, yeah, it's just it's the truth. So, I mean, one of the things you might want to do is use multiple calendars in Google Calendar and Windows well, there Phone. You go. It's not, That's an example. not doable. Yeah. You might want to use any calendar from Yahoo on right. Windows Phone. Not doable. You might want to use uh, Mobile Me with uh, not with Outlook, but with Windows Live Mail. Not doable. Um, you want want to use Google stuff with Windows Live Mail. Doable for Gmail. Not doable for Contacts. Not doable for Google Calendar. Not in a sync sense. I mean, obviously you can copy that information in there somehow, but you can't keep them synchronized. You know, you want to be able to edit a contact in your phone and have it edited up in the cloud. Have it edited down in your window, where whatever client you're using on Windows or whatever. Um, these things are not as easy as they should be. It's the reason that 
Apple is coming up with this iCloud thing, so people that buy into their total solution, it will always work. You know, that's the reason why something like that's actually pretty valuable. That's actually why what I do is I have my mail go to Gmail, but then I use an IMAP client to get it, and I yes. use the advanced, sophisticated features of the IMAP client. I actually use a company called Fastmail uh, yep. to do the stuff that you are talking about. And then I can use a standard cli uh, desktop client. I can use a mobile, all that mm. stuff. So I can, I will, that's exactly how I get around it, to be honest. I will tell people that on iOS, and this is true of both the iPad and the iPhone, uh, if you do use Gmail and Google Calendar, you're better off using a web app version of right. those services, That's not right. the native application, because Google custom tailors them to that those environments, yeah. and it gives you those archive buttons, and you can create them as yep. a shortcut on the on the start page of either device, and I, that is, in fact, how I do that, and it works better works than great. the app. Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the Android tablets, actually, Gmail is pretty sweet. I guess, you know, speaking of which, uh, frankly, that's how I do it in Windows, too. I mean... I use a Google, I'm sorry, a Chrome shortcut for both Gmail and Google Calendar so that they appear as pseudo apps. There's no syncing. I'm just accessing the server through a web browser. It doesn't look like one, but it's the web interface. And I'm kind of bypassing the need to, uh, you know, install or configure a local client, essentially. Hey, did you, I don't think we mentioned this, but uh, today the uh, SDK for Connect came out. Yeah, that's, gonna, that's my pick. Okay, I, I won't say anything. Pick. Your picks, jerk. Jerk. <laughs> your picks still to come. Oh, and just the show's ruined. Shoot, I knew I should have scrolled farther down the <laughs> the outline. Hey, I'll tell you what my pick is. These great folks yes. at Audible.com. It's a great way to <laughs> read, even when you know nowadays in this modern world we just don't have time to read. Yeah. And by the way, Solaris, have you, uh, you, that was going to be your recommendation last week. I said mum, mum's the word on that one because we're going to yep. do it on Twitter. That excellent So it's still choice. my pick, though. It's Stanislaw awesome. Stanislaw Lem. Today is Bloom's Day. Happy Bloom's Day. This is the day, June 16th, mm -hmm. that Leopold Bloom wandered Dublin in James Joyce Ulysses. And so, as always, their, their copy of Ulysses, if you wanted to buy it, is $90. You can get this for free right now if you go to audible.com slash windows it's the reason it's so expensive it's 27 hours by the way if you're going to buy the ulysses you should know that this is not the you know odysseus story no i mean it is it no, is it's sort a different of, ulysses if yeah. you're looking for like cyclops and whatnot you're going to be <laughs> no excited. you're not going to find him uh lots of good choices you actually have a, a very interesting pick why don't you tell the world your uh, so Paul and I both yeah, love I mean, there's two. I mean, so there's the one from last week, which is Solaris. Um, this is really interesting to me on, on many, many levels. It's, um, it's, it's free probably, too, by the way. The one that we're well, going to no, talk no, about. actually, this is Solaris. The first oh, one, is Solaris. Okay, right. you were going to talk about so, another one too. We'll talk about that. Later. Yeah, I'll talk about both. Um, the first one <laughs> is probably most famous in the U.S. because it was a movie with uh, George Clooney, right? And it's this kind of slow-moving space drama, you know, where basically this guy's wife has died. And he goes up to the space station, and then he starts seeing her. And what and the reason he's there is because uh, everyone on the station has gone mad. They've killed each other, and he needs to find out what's going on. And then he starts having his own um, issues. Right. So a lot of people don't like the movie. I actually kind of like the movie. It's not an action flick by any stretch of the imagination. But I've al I always found the story really interesting. And then I later discovered that it's based on, I believe, a Polish sci-fi novel and that there was a i've written russian I, I actually thought it was german when i watched it but i, I believe well, it's Stanislaw russian Lem is is uh, i think he's it's polish well no i mean there's, there's an original well, there's movie a russian version. movie right, right 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 i believe it's russian i thought when i wa i watched this movie and it looks to me i thought i actually thought it was german that's how unsophisticated i am but anyway i guess it's russian um you can get that on netflix by the way so that might be interesting to do um, it's just as slow moving as the Clooney version. I mean, it's, you know, but I, there's something about it, and maybe it's um, this is a little bit of uh, geek geekdom stupidity that I'll be uh, sorry that I ever mentioned. But um, if you've ever played any role playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, um, there was a game called Traveler, which was a basically a science fiction version of Dungeons and Dragons, mm -hmm. and there was actually a game that was very much like this, like a module or whatever, where you know, you go up to a space station that you, no one knows what happened. And, you know, this story always kind of reminded me of that. But anyway, the original book has been re-translated into English, and they're calling it the definitive version. And there's an audio version of it available now on Audible. 
that is read by um, Alessandro Giuliani, who you may know as Lieutenant Gaeta on Battlestar Galactica, the new version. He's the cute. And, he's the cute one. Is like on the bridge there. I that, okay. Love him. So <laughs> <laughs> no, he's really cute. All right. Isn't he? Um, Come on. If you you should. I don't know if you can do this easily from where you are, but you should uh, play oh, a clip of. Should the, play a little bit of it. It's, it's it is fantastic. Yeah. I don't know what you never At know. At 1900 what... hours ship's time, I climb down the metal ladder past the bays on either side into the capsule. It's already faster moving than Inside, the movie. Inside, there was just enough room <laughs> to raise my elbows. After I attached the end of the cables into the port jutting from the side of the capsule, you know what? I'm going to guess. Spacesuit filled with air, and from that point on, I couldn't make the slightest movement. I love. I see, stood. Or you're right. Ran. I love how he, he's he's. he's you really feel like you're it. listening to the guy. Yes, it's really great. Well done. There's some there's some good connection here. I, I it's there there are good there are books that are just good on Audible for whatever reason. Um, there are books maybe where it's a toss up. You could listen to it or you could read it. Whatever. This right. one is an Audible book. I I got this one on Audible. That's how I'm listening to it. Yeah, I agree. It's just the way to go. Well, it's I like you know maybe this is uh, the key. I like first person stories, and this is written in the first person. On Audible, because yep. you feel like you're listening to the guy talk his the way through the story. So this is a good a good example uh, of that. I can't wait to get it. I'm, uh, you've convinced me. That's a good one. And I was not a fan of the movie. No, I, a lot of people aren't. And and this is not, this is one of those things. You know, we talked about Hudson Hawk. We kind of joked about it. I, I think the deal with Hudson Hawk is most people haven't seen it, but they've heard it was terrible, so they right. think it's terrible. Right. With this movie, a lot of people have seen it, and they just don't like it. And I completely understand. It's slow moving. But there's just something about it. It has this kind of hopeless vibe. It's it's really about relationships and uh, about saying goodbye to people that die and all that stuff. And it, it's um, I, I, watch I, this. You don't believe me? Add to cart. <laughs> I am adding this to my cart right now. I'm going to buy it. And folks, you can get it for free too. Audible.com/windows. You'll sign up for the gold account. That means your first book is free. See zero dollars. Next step, I'm going to check out, and I'm going to own this sucker. And by the way, by the way, since you've been clicking around the screen, I've actually seen what my next two picks are, and I they're they're already lined up. But this is the you fun happen part. to have gone by both of them, so I won't give those away. It's but. so fun. Audible is so fun. It's just really the it's like the best bookstore ever. And yeah. even though nowadays in our modern world we just don't have time to read, look at this. This is a new feature, by the way. Send wirelessly to your Kindle. Yeah. You can actually. Please pay no attention to the fact that I've named my Kindle Lady Grey. Uh, uh, <laughs> you sicken me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great Kindle. Um, I love this new feature that you can, uh, Audible Books can go right to your Kindle. In fact, the new Kindles have your Audible Books in your library, which is so slick. That's because Amazon owns Audible. Audible yep. is just it. it you, who has time these days to read? But you do have time when you're in the car driving, carpool or commuting, going to the gym, working out. Hey, you can put on the noise-canceling headphones like I do and go mow the lawn. Exactly. Exactly. That way you won't hear it when you mow over your phone. <laughs> Audible. No, you put, it, you put the phone in your pocket. Audible.com slash Windows. It is so freaking awesome. And, yes, this was your other pick. Yes. Samuel L. Jackson. This is only five minutes, so it's free uh, to well, anybody. This is, this is a no-brainer. It's free. I'm going to play. I'm going to actually take a chance. Yeah. And play a little bit of Go to the F to well, the All the kids it's from daycare are in dreamland. The froggy has made his last leap. Hell no, you can't go to the bathroom. You know where you can go? The f to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> it goes on. It gets oh, yeah. better. Anybody who's That's ever had beautiful. kids. This is the Absolutely. Book That's exactly my point. Yep. If you have ever had a kid, <laughs> you know, you've had this conversation <laughs> in your head anyway. You no, said I, sometimes out in the in just in the world. I mean, oh, you just want because to eventually you it, look, I don't care who you are, Mr. Rogers, whatever. Eventually you lose patience with these people. Oh, yeah. You know, where it's like, yes, the 13th glass of water later. Seriously, I'd like to finish a 30 minute TV show without being interrupted by you at 11 o'clock at night. Usually I'm in tears and I'm begging, please go. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. I've been there. This is free. I don't know. Now I'm a member, so I it's zero dollars. I think even if you're not a member, you can go and get this for free from Audible. And by the way, I, you know, unfortunately, I tweeted about this, and I'm not sure if this is an Audible thing or, or across the board, or if it's just for this. But I, I, apparently, this offer is only in the U.S. Oh man, 
based and that's, on what you I, cannot blame Audible for that. That's because the company that published this originally yeah. has different interlocking deals internationally, and that's that's unfortunate because it means that somebody else owns the rights in other countries, and they haven't released this to be uh, audio. Yep, that's all. Audible does their best, and many of these books are. Uh, many of these books are not available, and we should say that that we always when we recommend a book, these are. It always happens, years. you know. Someone will yeah. say, "I'm looking at this." Kills this me. book you mentioned. I really want to get yeah. it, but the URL you have doesn't, you know, resolve. Sorry, I apologize. And, uh, yeah, you Thirty percent of how, our how audience, you know? thirty you know? percent or maybe more on this show of our audience is outside the U.S. And I just apologize. It's just the way uh, yeah. advertising still and publishing. These are two two businesses that have yet to figure out how to handle international sales and international right. stuff. Uh, let's get your uh, picks of the week here. Okay. Here's a quick um, Windows Weekly Tip of the Week is, you know, Apple recently announced this iCloud thing, which is, I, I have to give them credit because it's a, it's a classic Apple solution in the sense that all of these capabilities basically exist already. But what they've done is they've tied them all together into a integrated service, you know, one thing. And so, you know, kudos to that. But if you're looking forward to the six months or whatever that's going to pass before iCloud comes available, it's actually possible to duplicate most of that functionality today using other free services. And if you're a Microsoft-centric person such as I am, uh, you can do a lot of that stuff using Microsoft services today. So rather than step through every one of the features in iCloud, um, I would just point you to the super site for Windows at winsupersite.com. And I have an article called iCloud, how it stacks up against existing solutions, where I basically step through those each of the features that they announced and then explain what's available when it is. Um, this is so great. Thank you for writing this. This is fantastic. And and you do acknowledge that some of these, like backup, uh, iCloud does. Oh, yeah, does That's, great. absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, not, as usual with Paul, a very detailed, thorough article about this subject at winsupersite.com. And now your Windows 7 app pick. If somebody hadn't telegraphed this, it'd be a great surprise. <laughs> That's okay. Sorry. So, Microsoft today finally released the Connect SDK for Windows. And this is the software development kit that developers can use to write uh, in C Sharp or Visual Basic or C++ uh, applications that take advantage of the Connect add-on for the 360. So cool. PC. Yeah, so I think, you know, obviously uh, a developer software kit is not going to be very interesting to most of the people listening to this, but the thing you need to understand is that within days of this, I think we're going to see cool utilities appear online Yay. from people who are going to integrate the Connect with Windows in fun ways, so something to look forward to. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, I... To be honest, as much as I like Connect and I play Dance Central, I I don't think anybody's going to complain when I unplug the Connect from the Xbox and put it on my PC. Right. We do have a link in our chat room to uh, GTFTS. Okay. <laughs> Go they f to sleep. Uh, yep. That's internationally uh, usable. SFFaudio.com oh, has it, so you you too can hear it. Uh, I guess it's. Uh, Samuel L. Jackson's so perfect for that, you know. He's so great. He's so great. Um, and apparently this works internationally, so that's good. This is actually a cool site, sffaudio.com. Um, your, finally, your Windows Phone 7 app pick of the week. Yeah, this was a last-minute replacement. I had a couple of games in here originally, but Evernote today just yes! released for Windows Phone 7. And um, Evernote is awesome. You know, oh, I, I love it. This one's really interesting to me because... I, I use OneNote and will continue using OneNote, but there's something about Evernote. I, I completely get it. Yep. They do a great job. They have native apps on every platform imaginable. They have a great web app. Uh, they just do a great job. There's a pro version that has more features and all that stuff. And um, I, I, based on their blog post, which is incredibly long, um, it's not available everywhere yet, but we'll be cascading out today. So sometime today, you should be able to go find this on the Windows Phone Marketplace. But when you look at the shots they have of this thing, it is such a full-featured-looking client. Um, it, it just looks like it's just a wonderful-looking thing. Um, so if you're looking for a cross-platform note-taking solution, I mean, this is a, this is a great choice. 
and um, definitely something I, I we had written uh, and I had written and we had discussed uh, note taking apps in the cloud and there are basically two from my perspective OneNote and Evernote and um, Evernote's awesome so I d definitely check this one out. I, I have to agree and in fact that's to me that is that and Angry Birds are the without. Sine qua non, as they say in Latin. <laughs> gonna, I keep checking. I've been checking all you know all afternoon to see if this thing was is here yet. Without which nothing. You must yeah, have. Yeah, it's um, it's a good one. Yeah. I use on my... the neat thing about Evernote is you can use it on all your desktops, and it's on yep. now. It's on every portable device, so it's just really you're never it's without super, that stuff. Yeah, it's ubiquitous. Yep. It's just fantastic. Yeah, that, and that's the thing. So uh, OneNote is great uh, in the Windows world. There's a web app version; anyone can access that for free. There's obviously the native application that's in every version of Windows 2000. Uh, they have it on iOS, although not on the iPad. There's no iPad native version, which drives me crazy. But um, if Beautiful. if you need to use any, it's on yeah. Windows Phone. So if you're using anything but other than an iPhone or a Windows phone, I mean, Evernote has you covered. They have a they have a client for everything. I'm sorry, I just received my lunch. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, that's okay. I, but I, you're I keeping me from this. Oh, what is that? Is that uh, buffalo mozzarella? Yes, it's a caprese. Uh, caprese salad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my favorite. Yep. Yes. Um, well, Paul Torat, um, I want to thank you for a wonderful show. <laughs> okay, Dracula. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I've what gone happened. from being Sheriff J. P. Mortimer <laughs> and Ernst Stavro Blofeld to Dracula. Buford T. Buford Justice. Buford T. Justice. Uh, Paul Torat is at the Super Safe Windows. You really, you know what? Uh, this is the site you got to go to every single day. I do. Win <laughs> I do. <laughs> Winsupersite.com. <laughs> he is also the acclaimed author of so many great books, including Windows Phone Secrets and the soon to be released. Well, soon in September soon to be started. Well, soon to be started. <laughs> yeah. That's a better way to describe it. You're not worried we're gonna, about We're the... going to be very aggressive on the release on this one. You think you That's... can do day and date. I think you can do it. We're absolutely going to do day and date. I think you can do it. Uh, no that matter would... when it is. <laughs> the Windows 8 Secrets. No more Super Bibles. It would be great to have a Windows 8 Super Bible as well. Yeah, what happened to the Wake group? They're... Ted Waite's around somewhere. I was just talking to somebody about Ted Waite. What happened to him? Yeah, he's sitting in a hot tub somewhere. He's enjoying like, life on your royalties. Money. Yeah. yeah. I never did give Paul any of that money. <laughs> I'm doing great. Not Ted Not uh, Ted Waite. No, Ted Waite was the founder of, um, of Gateway. Don't they have the same name? Ted Waite of the Waite group. He has an E on the end. Yeah, not not the guy from Gateway, but not the, the guy. Gateway Ted Wade. Yeah, but that's the same name. The same. It's Ted, though, right? It is Ted. I believe it is Ted Wade. The the Wade. I think group. it is. Yeah, I think so. I I I uh, I know I I know I know Ted. Uh, but I haven't talked to him in a long time. I'm just wondering what he's up to these days. Folks, we're out of uh, out of runway, so <laughs> we're either going to take off or crash into a ditch. Your choice. Wow. Paul right. Therott, thank you so much for being here. We do this show every Thursday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv. It is fun to watch live because you can see all the swearing and the cussing and the tearing and of the hair. The James Bond villain pictures the and villain the bar pictures. Cards. Yeah. We'll edit all of those out of the, 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 <laughs> the audio and the video. Which the you hell can you get. will. <laughs> yeah, I know. I always say that. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then our editors go, no. Yeah, not, yeah it's not no, I'm busy eating my salad. Thank you. Uh, you can oh, by the way, before we leave, I should yes, congratulate the Boston Bruins, by the way. For yes! The... Bruins! Beat those yes. Canucks! Handily! Yeah! <laughs> not so, handily, actually. It, it kind of took everything. It, it took everything, a while. But they, they fought long and hard. I'm not a hockey fan, so I don't, I don't really care about hockey per se, but some of my friends are huge hockey fans, and this is really meaningful to, to them. As is my grandmother, by the way, who's about 200 years old. So well, that's, that's she, fair because neither she nor any of the players have teeth. But yes, but I mean, she. You know, we haven't had a championship here. You know, in thirty years. Oh, no, it's but, about uh, time the Bruins won. Forty years. Degree. 40 Although I got to point out, New England's been doing very well in the major league sports area. It's been a good decade. Good decade for champions. Yep. Yeah. Now yeah. we've had the yeah Patriots three times, the Red that's, Sox twice, Red Celtics, Sox. and now uh, the Bruins. Now the Bruins. Yeah. I think we're done. Okay. Uh, Paul Thorat. I don't know why I do a Maine accent, because I don't think any of those teams were from Maine. No. No. Same thing. Maine is just North Massachusetts. <laughs>
<laughs> I love doing this show. Thank you, Paul. We will see you next week on Windows Weekly. They keep bringing me more food. Look, now I have a little cup. Cabagu with uh, some uh, fine cheese. You must have a good Italian restaurant nearby. Where do we get this? Is this Luma or who is this? La Dolce Vita. Oh, yeah, that's our local wine bar. Yeah, that's good. More famous for wine than uh, food, but I have to say this looks very good. No, it looks good. They are. They should be famous for the Caprese. That looks incredible. So thanks, Paul. <laughs> thanks. I apologize for cutting you off on the Windows history I don't have any idea what you're talking about. Well, but apology I, I accepted. I feel like, you know, we could have gone on. <clears throat> I just wanted to reflect <laughs> for a bit. <laughs>